Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument. My name is David Hernandez. Everybody knows me as David. I am a volunteer. I do not work here. I am retired twice. I'm retired from the United States Air Force Reserve, where I was a lieutenant colonel, and I'm retired from the Department of Homeland Security, where I was a special agent on the border. And because I'm retired twice, I don't do anything from Monday to Fridays, and then Saturdays and Sundays I rest. <laughs> Except for Wednesdays, where I come here and I'm part of the historic weapons um, militia and we give talks. You are in the oldest masonry fort in North America, the Castillo de San Marcos. It is the oldest fort in North America, but it's the tenth fort here. There were nine others before this one. They were made out of wood, so they burnt down or rotted. Now I say 350, the fort is 350 years old, but it's very difficult for us to understand what 350 means. I'm old, but I'm not 350. <laughs> Hopefully I'll make it there, I doubt it. But to give you an idea, when the pilgrims arrived to Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower, the first babies that had been born in St. Augustine were already grandparents. And the first baby born here, Martinico de Arguelles, was born in St. Augustine in 1566. They were going to arrive on the Mayflower until 1620. He was 54 years old, living in Merida, Mexico. Now, St. Augustine is the oldest continuously inhabited uh, city in North America. But it's the 13th attempt by Europeans to establish something. The first 12 failed, everybody died. The first time a European made it to North America was Juan Ponce de Leon. I'm sure you've heard the myth of the Father of Youth. He arrived just north of here in Punta Vedra Beach in the year 1513. You realize that it's 107 years before the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. The Spanish were already here. And because of European law, they owned everything to include Canada. Oh, uh, can't tell you, the Native Americans didn't believe that. <laughs> they said, hey, you don't know anything. But that's what they said. But to the Spanish, anything north of St. Augustine was worthless and care about it. So when the British came into the north, they could have it, they could have it, they could have it, until they got to St. Augustine. From this point on, they fought. They would not let them in. This is the only fort in the world that was never defeated in actual battle. That's how important St. Augustine was to the Spanish. Now we're talking 300, 350, 400 years ago. During that time, many things happened. And one of the things that doesn't get a lot of talk is the Irish influence in the Spanish colonies. Now to understand that, you have to go back in time. You gotta go back in time to 1503, where this young king, Henry VIII of England, is married to Catherine of Aragon. Her real name was Catalina de Aragon. She was the daughter of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, the king and queen that sent Christopher Columbus. Now, Henry, England at the time was a very small nation, while Spain was the largest nation the world had ever known. Almost 70% of the earth was under Spanish rule, technically. Uh, the natives didn't believe that, but different stories. How, but Catherine was significantly older than Henry. And they only had one child, Mary, Queen of Scots. She was a girl. And when uh, Catherine could no longer have kids, Henry did not have an heir to the British throne. And by the way, Henry was a Catholic. So was Catherine. Then Henry becomes obsessed with this woman named Anne Boleyn. And what? But Anne Boleyn does not, refuses to, refuses to be his mistress, would only marry him. But there was a problem, Henry was already married. So Henry goes to the Pope, Pope Clement VII, to get his wedding annulled, his marriage annulled, there was no divorce. That way he could marry Anne Boleyn. But the Pope, Catholic, was very, it was very important to the Pope what the King and Queen of Spain said. They were the most powerful people in the world. They were Catholic. And obviously, King and Queen of Spain did not want 
their daughter to have her marriage annulled. So they pressure Clement VII, and he refuses to annul the marriage to Henry and Catholic. So Henry decides he's going to break away from the Catholic Church, creates the Church of England, names himself Hen, and a little bit after that, the Church of England annuls the marriage between Catherine and Henry. He's free to marry Anne Boleyn. And they have one child, a daughter, <laughs> Elizabeth I. So now you understand the, Brit the Spanish monarchy is furious that this young upstart king has snubbed them, insulted them. So they want to fight, they want to punish him. But they have just kicked out the Muslims, the Moors from Spain. In 1492, they had gotten, finally gotten rid of the Moors. And the way they got it was they couldn't tell the people, you want to fight for the king and queen, they're not going to die for the king and queen. But if they told the people, we're fighting for God, the Catholic Church, religion against the Muslims, they would fight. So they use the same argument. You're not fighting because they insulted the king and queen. We're going to fight the British because they insulted God and they are no longer Catholics. They're Protestants, <laughs> which resonates. Now, England at the time is expanding, it's expanding very quickly. They don't have enough people for their armies and their navies. So they start forcing other people to join against their will. A lot of Irishmen were forced into the British Navy and the British Army against their will. Especially since the British are Catholic, the Irish are, I mean the British are uh, Protestants and the Irish are Catholic. They don't like that. So they're starting to have all kinds of problems between the Irish and the British. At the same time, there was an ancient Spanish legend that a Spanish king from antiquity named Mir Espanye left what is now Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, with his subjects and traveled north. And they found and settled an island off the west coast of Brittany that was uninhabited. That island is called Ireland, which meant that every Irishman was actually a Spanish descendant of this king. So the government of Spain, who wanted to drain people away from the British, would grant automatic Spanish citizenship to any Irishman, any anybody from Ireland, because they were descendants from Spain. But they had to have two requirements. One is they had to be white, and two, they had to be Catholic. For the Irish, that was no problem. They wanted to join Spain because they wanted to fight against the British who were oppressing them. Now, at the same time, those that did want to fight, the only way you could get an education back then, learn to read and write, was to join the clergy, be a priest or a nun. So many Irishmen became priests. Once they became priests, the Catholic Church would send them all over the world to preach the gospel. Catholic gospel. The largest nation in the world at the time was Spain, Catholic. So many, many Irish priests were sent all over the world to Spanish colonies to preach the gospel. They were sent by the Catholic Church. Now you see how all these issues start generating on how so many Irish came with the British. Now, one of the first encounters of Irishmen here in this area was in the, um, the late 1600s, 1697. I'm sorry, 1597, 1597. The Catholic Church assigns a father, Ricardo Artur, to be the vicar of St. Augustine. Vicar's kind of like the head priest. His real name was Richard Arthur. He was Irish. <laughs> so he becomes the head priest of St. Augustine. That's one of the first encounters that we know. Another one in the early 1600s. Have you been up to St. George Street, downtown? There was a section of St. George Street called Calle de San Patricio, St. Patrick Street. Irish. In a map drawn by the British in 1764, 
there is reference to the Ermita de San Patricio, the St. Patrick's Shrine, the Irish St. Patrick is there. So that's just showing you how the Spanish and the Irish started getting together. And there are no numerous, numerous, numerous um, examples. I'm going to be giving you some examples. And listen to the first name and the last name of the person. And you, you, you start seeing where it is. In 1763, Spain loses Florida to Great Britain in the uh, Seven Years' War. Well, during that time, England takes over Havana and destroys Havana. I mean, just destroys it. So after they get Spain, uh, Spain gets Havana back, they have to rebuild um, uh, Havana. Well, they send to be in charge of that reconstruction a um, Alberto O'Neill. <laughs> I'm sorry, it wasn't O'Neill, it was um, O'Reilly. Alberto O'Reilly, an Irishman. And they make him a field marshal in the Spanish army. And he's in charge of rebuilding Havana. The very big fort in Havana, Cuba, La Cabana, he was actually responsible for rebuilding it. After he's got it almost done, they send him to Puerto Rico because the Dutch had basically done a number on the Spanish. So he gets there to figure out to better the defenses of San Juan, and he realizes they need a bigger fort. So he puts another Irishman, Tomas O'Daly, <laughs> interesting names, Tomas O'Daly, <laughs> in charge of building the Castillo de San, de San Cristóbal, which is the largest <coughs> fort that Spain built anywhere in the world. It's so big that the taxi in San Juan fix is, is inside the courtyard. Okay? And they get the walls and streets in. Now, at the same time, in 1780s, 1776, the U.S. declares war for the revolution, independence. Spain starts helping the Americans for the war of independence. And Spain is over in the Louisiana area, and they attack the British colonies. So in the Battle of Pensacola, which happens to be the longest battle of the American Revolution, by the only 24 Americans participated in that battle. They were all Spanish, blacks, and Native Americans. They take Pensacola away from Great Britain. Well, on the final attack on Pensacola, the dislodged, there was a Hiberian Irish regiment of soldiers that basically spearheaded. And their commander was Arturo O'Neill. <laughs> so when the British are removed from Pensacola, and that becomes a Spanish colony again, Arturo O'Neill becomes the governor. And an Irishman becomes the governor of West Florida. Now, now the British have been kicked out of Florida. King Carlos realizes that there are still a bunch of English-speaking people in Florida. So he wants some priests that can speak English. So he personally recruits a Tomas Pallet and a um, Manuel O'Reilly, two Irish priests to come to St. Augustine because they knew English, French, Spanish, and some Native American languages. So they arrived here in 1784 to become the priest. Now, one of the interesting things is Father ha ha Hallett, Has Haslett, got a funny name, establishes the first free public school in North America that is open to children of both sexes and children of all races. So there was a public school here in 1784 that girls could go to school and black children could go to school right here, St. Louis. Another member of that Hiberian regiment who was, they stationed a whole a group of Hiberian soldiers here, Irish expatriates, was a Carlos Howard, who was fluent in English, Spanish, French, Native American languages, and becomes the, the secretary of the scribe 
to the governor of St. Augustine, Manuel Céspedes. And he's the governor for many years, and Carlos Howard is his right-hand man. Another Irish officer, Juan O'Donnell, <laughs> marries Governor Céspedes' daughter, Dominga. Marries you. Now, remember I said in Puerto Rico, they had a, uh, um, O'Reilly went there as a field marshal, and he assigned uh, O'Daly to build the fort. But once that starts, other Irishmen start to come into Puerto Rico, and there's a Antonio Scarrett Irishman who starts a, a sugar plantation. And started sugar plantations in, in Puerto Rico. Hello? Now, that gives you an idea of Hello? so many Irishmen. There are many more, and so many that I have to, I have to read them down. <coughs> I can't memorize. One of the most famous ones is Fernando O'Higgins, <laughs> who is considered the George Washington of Chile. He is the one that started the revolution, and basically the father of Chile is an Irishman, Fernando O'Higgins. And I got to read the rest of them because it's something. And these are very, very important Irishmen that became part of it. Um, he also had Juan Mackinac <laughs> in Chile. In uh, Venezuela, you had Francisco O'Connor, <laughs> Daniel O'Leary, who were part of Simon Bolivar's army. They were officers, commanders, colonels in Boli Simon Bolivar's army. In Mexico, you had Guillermo Lampart and Juan O'Donnell. In Mexico, in Cuba, John and Marina O'Bork. In Argentina, Patricio Lynch and Guillermo Brown. In Peru, Ambrosio O'Higgins. Okay? In Uruguay, Juan O'Brien, Miguel O'Gorman. So these are very important people within those countries' histories who are of Irish descent. Now my favorite story of all of this occurs here, St. Augustine. In 1697, that's 19, uh, 19 years, 23 years before the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. Remember I told you that the, the um, Catholic Church assigned Father Ricardo Artur to be the vicar of St. Augustine. He was Irish, Richard Arthur. Well, on March 17, 1601, Father Artur has a celebration and a parade in honor of St. Patrick and has a St. Patrick's Day parade here in St. Augustine every year till 1604. It's in the church documents and record. And he declares St. Patrick's the patron saint of the St. Augustine cornfields. So 19 years before the Mayflower and the Pilgrims, they're having St. Patrick's Day parades here in St. Augustine. It's before anything up north. By the way, those of you who are going to be here on St. Patrick's Day, it's going to be it's going to be pretty crowded. It's a big deal, St. Patrick's Day. Now, this uh, Irish and Spanish uh, thing still continues today. I am originally from Puerto Rico. My ancestry is about seventy percent Spanish, about fifty percent Native American, ten percent African. So is my wife both from Puerto Rico. Our daughters, 100%, are basically all uh, Spanish and Iberian and Native American. My oldest daughter's husband, Irish descent. <laughs> <laughs> Irish descent. So it, has, it even continues today. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If I know the answer, I will give it to you. If I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. <laughs> if you Google it, I'll be home. So thank you for visiting the Castilla de Santa Cruz.